Father, we're so thankful for your presence. And as we turn to thee, we pray that you'll anoint us with your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to say happy Sabbath to each one. And the Lord has been blessing us. Amen. We have some tremendous things to cover through the course of this meeting. We have a few sessions. Beginning now, we have a few sessions that we're going to begin to uh, uncover some very tremendous things. I, come, I pray that you've come ready to study. Are you ready to study? Are you ready to have your mind going through some mental exercises? We have to study a great deal because we have to come to the place where we can see where we are in 2009 according to Bible prophecy. And as we look at this, we're going to see some, uh, there's going to be a need of preparation. Now this is the book, Early Writings. How many have heard of this book? In this book, Early Writings, there's a tremendous statement here that I want to read before we really get started this morning. In Early Writings, page 64, listen to what the prophet of God says. Early Writings 64, it says, Time is almost finished. Do you reflect the lovely image of Jesus as you should? Then I was pointed to the earth and saw that there would have to be a getting ready among those who have at late embraced the third angel's message. Said the angel, get ready, get ready, get ready. You will have to die a greater death to the world than you've ever died. You know that right now there are many that are alive to the world. You can never be ready to meet Jesus while we're so attracted to the world like we are today. One of the first things that persons do when they wake up in the morning, if it's a weekday, they cut on the, the news to see what's going on, what the weather is going to be like, what the traffic is like. My friends, that's not the first thing a Christian should do. The first thing the Christian needs to do is to turn his eyes upon Jesus. You see, the only news that man needs that is essential for man's life is the news that comes from the most holy place. My friends, Jesus is in charge of that weather station. And when we turn our eyes there, Jesus tells us that we will have to die a greater death to the world than we've ever yet died. Now, many of us, we think that we may not be so alive to the world, but do you know that most of us, we're trapped and are filled into our jobs. We're trapped by the circumstances of our family lives. And these things are not wrong in and of themselves. It was not wrong for Lot and his wife to love their family, but, Lot, but, but Lot's wife's love was so much involved in the cares of this life that when she was told to get out of that crisis, it pulled her back. You remember what Jesus said about her? He said, remember what? Remember Lot's wife. And you know, many of us, were just like Lot's wife. We can even see a need of getting a preparation, and yet we're still alive to the world. And when she looked back, everything that she had been moving toward was lost. Did you know that? And today, in this last generation, God has told us to remember that in our minds. It says we'll have to die a greater death to the world than we've ever yet died. And then she says two things, and I want to make sure that you catalog this. You know, there were teachers that would used to say when you were in class, Remember this because this is going to be on the test. My friends, what I'm telling you now is going to be on the test. You need to remember this. There are two things, and I want to make sure that I catalog it and make sure that you remember it. And that is, as I read it, I want to see if you catch what those two things are. Even as I read it, listen to what it says. Early writing 64, it says, I saw that there was a great work to do for them, and but little time in which to do it. Did you hear two things? What did you hear? There was a great, there is a great work, and what else? And little time in which to do this great work. Now, everything we study is going to be tremendous. We're going to study line upon line, text upon text. We're going to go through roughly 6,000 years of human history. But as we look at this, there are only two great things that we must understand. We must understand what is the great work and what is the little time in which to do it. Because think about it. If there was a great work to be accomplished and you don't know what the work is, how can you get it done? And if you know what the work is but you think you have 
more time to do that work than the time allotted, then you can think that I have up until this time and the deadline has already been passed. Do you understand what I'm saying? So as we study through this, inspiration says, there is a great work and but little time in which to do it. And what I'm telling you this morning is the majority of Seventh-day Adventists don't even know what the great work is. And as a result, we don't even know what the little time is. And so Satan is trying to divert us from these two things. What is the great work? And what is the little time in which to do it? And this is tremendous for us because in order for the work to be finished, Jesus said, and this gospel of the kingdom shall be what? Shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. This gospel work is what must be accomplished in this last hour. But my friends, there are four great parts of the gospel work. What did I say? Four great parts that must be united into one whole in order for this gospel to go forth as Jesus gave it. Because he said, and this gospel, very specific, we studied last night. And we found out that this gospel was the same as the everlasting gospel in the threefold message of Revelation 14. Four great parts, and I want to ask you this morning before we really start studying today, what do you think the four parts are? What are the four parts of the gospel? What would you say? If I were to ask you that what are the four great parts of the gospel that we see in the life of Jesus, what would you tell me that those four great parts were? What would you say? Someone said to fear God and give glory to him. Now, this is not simply a great part of it. We'll notice from the Bible what the great parts are. Go to the book of Matthew. What book did I say? To the book of Matthew chapter 4. And I want you to notice because the gospel message, who gave the gospel message best? Can anyone improve upon Jesus' method of giving the gospel? Can you improve upon how Jesus preached the gospel? We cannot improve upon it. The best we can do is to imitate what Jesus did. Are you with me? And the Bible tells us how Jesus gave the gospel in the book of Matthew chapter 4. In the book of Matthew chapter 4, and when you get there, let me know by saying amen. In the book of Matthew chapter 4, notice what the Bible says. In the book of Matthew, the fourth chapter. Now, before we read that in the Bible, I want to put this up on the overhead, and I want you to read it with me. This is Satan's plan to make us unprepared for the last days. I put down just a few things that when you study the Bible in the spirit of prophecy, bears itself out. Number one, Satan's before the crisis, Satan plans to have you doing what? Living where? In the cities. I'm going to prove this from the Bible. This is Satan's plan for you, but we're going to find out that Satan's plan is normally the lifestyle that most of us have right now. To unprepare us for the great crisis. Number one, Satan's plan is to have us living in the cities dependent and not self-supportive. And there's a reason for this, because when the sunny laws pass, when the mark of the beast is enforced, no man is going to be able to buy or... And so in order to get man ready for that event, he wanted to bring him where man would be in a lifestyle where he's dependent upon the government and upon things in order to live. He would not be self-supportive. And the lifestyle for that is centered in the city. Number one, Satan will want us to be in the cities, and we can just say check mark because the majority of God's people are living, guess where? In the cities. Number two, Satan wants God's people to be out of shape, sick, and unhealthy. And my brothers and sisters, there's never been a generation that's more sick than we have today. And do you know that it used to be a time when the Seventh-day Adventist church was not as sick as the rest of the world, but in this generation, we find that many of the same diseases that plague the world plague Seventh-day Adventists. Prostate cancer, breast cancer, ulcers, tuberculosis, high blood pressure, diabetes, all of these things that are symptoms from following a worldly system of life is the same sicknesses that now appear in the church, and God never intended for his seven Adventists to be like that. You know God has given us a health message so that we could be the head and not the tail. 
God wanted us to be the healthiest, the happiest, the holiest people that have ever lived. And Satan's plan is to have us out of shape, sick, and unhealthy. Number three, in order to do this, he wanted to put us on a what type of diet? On a flesh diet. Now, my brothers and sisters, we may not want to believe it or not, but this is Satan's plan. Satan's plan is to get specifically God's church away from the Garden of Eden diet on to the sad diet that is plaguing America, on to a diet that is composed of flesh, animals, and animal products, and he knows that by doing this, he can destroy man's mind. My friends, if we look at this, Satan has checked almost all of these things is where we are today. Number four, caught up in the latest fashions of the day. Improper music, amusements, improper dress, improper education. Satan wants to make sure that the world is controlled by fashion and the system of education of this world. He is doing this to gain control of man's mind. Number five, in debt. Do you know that Satan wants us to be so far in debt that you and I feel like we can't do anything? Now, the majority of this world are in debt. Is that true? And he doesn't care how he does it. It says school loans, mortgage, car payments, anything to keep us trapped down in this world. Number six, ignorant and unconcerned about what? The truth for these last days. You know there's a generation that says, I don't care about being in the last days. I don't want to hear a message that shows us that we're in the time. It's only a gloom and doom message. Oh, there's not talking about peace and safety, my friends. Jesus is the one that's given us the book of Revelation. Am I right or wrong? And Satan would be glad for us to make any excuse not to make the Revelation our study. He would love for us to say, oh, it's a gloom and doom message. But the problem is, it is gloom and doom for the man who does not know Jesus. You tell me, how can you have sunshine without Jesus? How can you be happy about the last days if you don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ? My friends, if we don't have a relationship with Jesus, we should be very afraid. It is not safe to live in this world without knowing Jesus. But if we love Jesus, perfect love casteth out how much fear. You see, the only thing that makes man afraid in the message is that he does not know Christ. If we knew Jesus, we would not be afraid of the last days. We would be preparing and we would be going from every nation and kindred and tongue and people seeking to get a world ready. Because listen, even if you don't want to get ready, God is getting somebody ready. And the only thing that you can do is choose either to be a part of the work that is getting ready or not, because I'm going to prove before the day is over that the majority of seven Adventists today are not going to be ready when this event takes place. The majority of seven Adventists are going to be shaken out of God's church because they don't take salvation serious. And when you study through the Bible, from Genesis to Revelation, the majority of God's people have almost always been unprepared. I mean, think about the flood. Noah preached for 120 years. How many people on board that ark? Just eight souls. Were there only eight people in the world? There was a population increase. Noah preached for a long time, but the people came to the place where they did not care or want to hear the message that Noah presented. And they made their decision. And Jesus says, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the coming of the Son of Man. Man would be ignorant and unconcerned about the truths for the last days, especially the three angels' messages. And we find that of all people, Satan also wants to make the young people unconcerned because he knows that many of the young people are going to help to finish this work. And so, my friends, we're told that when this young, the young generation is rightly trained, that the message of Jesus Christ will soon go to all the world. Now, this says, number seven, Living by what? Traditions and feelings instead of living by the Word of God. You see, when we live by feeling, we say, well, I don't feel like doing that. Or we've always done things that way. But tell me something. What you feel is not true. Is that right? Doesn't mean it's true. A man may say, I don't feel like going to work. But if he doesn't go to work, he's in trouble, isn't he? So sometimes we put the feelings aside. You know, when it gets cold outside and you put your foot down on the floor and it's cold, you want to get back in the bed. But sometimes you cannot be moved by how you feel. Is that right? And so, my friends, if Jesus had went by his feeling, Jesus would not have gone to the cross of Calvary. But he said, not my will, but thy will be done. My friends, listen to me. 
We cannot live by traditions and feelings. Man says, well, our church has always done things that way. Does that make it right? Jesus constantly had to show his people in the Jewish nation that if we're living by traditions instead of the word of God, we will never be ready because Jesus said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeded out of the mouth of God. This is how a Christian lives, not by tradition, not by feeling, not by church manuals. Let me say that again. Not by church manuals that have been written by men. You see, church manuals can be wrong, but the Bible cannot be wrong. Am I right? We cannot live by creeds that have been composed by ecclesiastical councils if they contradict the Word of God. The Bible says to the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. But we live in a generation that when they want to consult what is right or wrong, they go to a church manual, and this is the only church manual that God gave us. Jesus said that a Christian would live not by tradition and feeling, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. And so, my friends, we must come back to the Bible, and I encourage you to bring your Bibles. Did you bring your Bibles this morning? Did you bring pen and paper this morning? Are you ready to study? And so we found out that the last thing is he wants us worshiping an unknown God because, my friends, I don't care what we've done. I don't care how many changes that we've made in our lives, changes that need to be made. If we don't know Jesus, we will never be ready for the last act in the drama. We will never be ready for the son-in-law. All of the changes that should be made that God has given us and moving from the cities and changing our diet and changing our dress and our education, the object of God in all of this is to bring us into a relationship with himself. But if we don't know Jesus, my friends, some are going to come to him and say, Lord, but didn't I, didn't I? And Jesus is going to say, but I don't know you. My friends, if ever there was a time to get to know Jesus, that time is now. And so the Bible says in the book of Matthew, what book did I say? We're looking at the four parts of the gospel. I didn't forget about that, amen. Matthew chapter 4, beginning in verses 35. Notice what the Bible says, Matthew 4, I'm sorry, beginning in verses 23. Matthew 4, beginning in verses 23. Let's read that together. The Bible says, and Jesus, who did this? Jesus went about all Galilee. Notice what he's doing. Teaching in their synagogues and preaching. What is he preaching? The gospel of the kingdom and healing all manner of sickness and all manner of disease among the people. This is Jesus' method of presenting the gospel. Until the gospel is presented like Jesus presented it, the world will never come to an end. Question. What are the four parts of the gospel? What do you think? Do you see anything here? What do you see here? We see what? One thing we see is what? We see teaching. Four parts. Number one, I'll put the first letter. Teaching for T. We see teaching. Is that right? In Jesus' presenting of the gospel, he did more than preaching. He was a teacher. There must be an education part of the gospel. Are you with me? This is why God has called seven Adventists to have schools and institutions that follow his program. Our institutions are to be educating a generation that would make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Now, if our institutions are not doing this, then our schools are not following the blueprint. If our schools are more concerned with making careers than in making Christians, we have a problem. If our schools are more concerned with teaching men and women how to make money instead of making them missionaries, we have a problem. Because Jesus was a missionary. He came to this earth to minister to the needs of man. And unless our education makes us like Jesus, then we don't need educational schools. The world has educational schools that you can go to for free. The reason why God has given us a system of education is because all of our children ought to be taught of the Lord. 
We are to be brought up and to be made and restored and to the image of Jesus perfectly, my friends. And unless we become missionaries, we have not been trained the way Jesus was trained. Now we see there was an education, teaching. But the Bible goes on to say, not only was there teaching and education, but it says he did what? And there was preaching. So the first part of the gospel was teaching. What is the second part? So more than just having schools, there is to be preaching. There is to be an evangelistic ministerial thrust of the message. If all we can do is concern, we're just feeling minds instead of bringing men and women into an evangelistic, soul-winning work, there's a problem. Jesus was not only a teacher, he was also a preacher. So we need teaching and preaching that deals with the ministerial phase of God's gospel work. And all of these are a part of the gospel. And if all of these parts are not blended, we don't have the gospel that Jesus was talking about. Are you with me? But not only was he preaching, the Bible says he was also doing what? He was doing what? So there was a third part. He was healing. So he was not only a teacher or a preacher, he was also a healer that tells us that in God's gospel work, there should be a ministry of healing, a medical missionary work, a work that ministers not only to the mind, but to the body. You see, when you look at man, the gospel is to reach the whole of man, and man is physical and mental and spiritual and so the gospel must have a teaching part and an educational part and a medical ministry part but today many have lost sight of the medical missionary work they've lost sight of the healing phase but there should not be one or the other we should not have preachers or teachers or healers or educators we need to have how many of them all of them blended unto one work. Are you with me? But sometimes this is all that men knows. They say there's only three parts, but do you know there's a fourth part of the gospel? From the Bible to the book of Mark. What book did I say? To the book of Mark chapter 1. Notice the fourth part of the gospel. We're told that unless these are all blended together, the work will never come to an end. Mark chapter 1, and when you get there, let me know by saying amen. Jesus was a teacher. He was a preacher. He was a healer. This is the way he gave his gospel message. And in the last days when we give the three angels messages, we must do the same thing that Jesus did. Now the Bible says in the book of Mark chapter 1, there's a fourth and final phase of the gospel. The Bible says beginning in verse 45, notice what it says. Jesus had just healed a leper. The leper was excited about the ministry of healing and teaching and preaching. And in verse 44, the Bible says, let's read that together. The Bible says, and saith unto him, see thou what? Say nothing to any man. But go thy way and show thyself to the priest and offer for thy cleansing those things which Moses commanded for a testimony unto them. Now notice what happens in verse 45. The Bible says, but when he went out and began to do what? He began to do what? He began to publish it much and to blaze abroad the matter insomuch that Jesus could no more enter where? Into the city, but was without in desert places, and they came to him from every quarter. There was something that caused the gospel of Jesus to become so blazed that Jesus could not even openly enter the city. It got the attention of the masses. What was it? Verse 45 says, he went out and began to do what? And began to publish. So the fourth phase is the publishing side of the meaning. This is why we have publishing houses. This is why we have literature. Now, the first part of publish, what are the first four letters? What are the first four letters of publish? P-U-B, what else? What is the four, first four letters of public? You see, the work of publishing is to get the gospel before the public. Are you with me? And publishing includes every form of media that can get the gospel into the public mind. 
This is why God would have us take advantage of radio waves and television waves and internet waves and CDs and DVDs and books. And the foundation of it all is the printed page. Are you with me? Now, everything we need to use while we have it. But I'm going to tell you, there's going to come a time when our use of the internet is going to go down. There's going to come a time when our use of the DVD and the CDs are going to go down. And there's going to come a time that some people are not even going to have any type of power to use any of these things. But for the printed page, you don't need any type of power, praise God. For the printed page, all you have to do is open up the book. You know, you can be in the dark. And under the light of the sun, you can open up the printed page. What do you say? And so we can never get away with all of the media. We can never get away. The printed page is the foundation of the publishing work. And in the last work, we're told that much of the loud cry will not be done by the lips of the preacher. It will be done by the silent messengers that we have passed out to people like the leaves of autumn. We need to get about the business. Every time we go somewhere, we try to find a way to get this message into the hands of men. When a, uh, 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 a man that is, uh, the, 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 when, when the uh, mailman comes to my house, you know that I give him some mail too? You see, when he gives me mail, he gives me some messages, I say, I got a message for you. You see, we have to take every opportunity to get this message before the world because the world does not know where we're going to stay. The world does not know that a national Sunday law is going to be passed. And the sad reality is that most Seventh-day Adventists don't know it either. We have become as drunk as the world. And what God wants to do is to awaken us so that we can see before it is too late and get about the business because there is a great work to accomplish and but little time in which to do it. Question, how much time do we have to do this work? When we say little time. What is, the, what is the event that marks the end of the little time that we have? We studied it last night. What is the event? The last act in the drama. What is the last act in the drama? So the little time we have as seven and a half minutes to get this work done, the first phase of this work is that you and I, by the passing of the National Sunday Law, have had to have accomplished this great work among the remnant church. Now, there are going to be other Christians that have time after the Sunday Law because they don't know what you and I know. Are you with me? But to whom much is given, much is required. To whom God has given light, we must be faithful to the light that God has put in our hands. There are many in the Sunday churches that do not have the light that we have, but as Seventh-day Adventists, God has given the accumulated light of the ages that's shining upon us. We have no excuse to be in darkness. And so, my friends, we have the little time. The little time goes up to the passing of a national Sunday law. And the great work, what do you think the great work is to accomplish? Now, the gospel is to produce the great work, but what is the great work that must be accomplished? Do you know what it is? The salvation of souls, well, that's, when we say the salvation of souls in this last hour, what do we mean? Because, see, there have been those that died, having never learned all the truth for this time, that they can still be saved before they had the light when they know Jesus. Are you with me? But there's something that God must do in this last generation that has not been done to the degree it has been done in, in order for us to be prepared for the seal of God in our foreheads. I'll read it to you. I heard somebody say it. I'll read it to you right here. Listen to what it says. Time is almost finished. Do you reflect the lovely image of Jesus as you should? What is the word? To reflect what? The lovely image of Jesus as we should. Now, is that partially or completely? Inspiration says that those who receive the seal of God, early writings, page 71, those who receive the seal of God must reflect the image of Jesus fully. And my brothers and sisters, I want to ask you a question. Do you think you look like Jesus fully this morning? Do you think that you look just like Jesus? Now, I'm going to ask you another question. What did Jesus look like? Go to 2 Peter. What book did I say? In the book of 2 Peter chapter 1. I'm sorry, 1 Peter. 1 Peter chapter 1. I want you to notice what the Bible says in 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2, and when you get there, let me know by saying amen. 1 Peter chapter 2. Now listen to what this says. We're going to the Bible, 1 Peter 2, but listen to what it says. It says, do you reflect the lovely image of Jesus as you should? 
I saw that there was a great work to do for them and but little time in which to do it. The great work and the little time is to make sure that God's people reflect the image of Jesus fully, completely, so that they can be ready for the seal of God in their foreheads. And today, we don't look just like Jesus. There are words that come out of our mouths that did not come out of the mouth of Jesus. Am I right? There are things that husbands say to their wives that never should have been said. There are things that wives say to their children, that wives say to their husband and parents to children, and children to parents, and members to church members. There are practices in our lives that need to come out. We don't yet look just like Jesus. And this is the great work to be done, and yet we have a little time. What is the little time? For seven Adventists to the passing of a national Sunday law. Now, the majority of the church are not being taught that today. The majority of the church are being taught that they have until Jesus comes to get ready to meet Jesus. Let me tell you something. If you wait for Jesus to come to get ready, you'll never be ready to meet Jesus. We must get ready before Jesus comes. And the last act in the drama marks this little time. Now, I go on to page 67. Listen to what it says. It says, deny self. You must step fast. Some of us have had time to get the truth and to advance step by step. And every step we have taken has given us strength to take the next. In other words, there was a time when they were able to walk in the Advent church step by step and be able to get strength to take the next. But we're told that that, that will not be forever. It says we must step fast. It says and every step we have taken has given us strength to take the next. But now time is almost finished. Oh, my brother and sister, we're going to prove that today. It says time is almost finished, and what we have been years learning, what we've been what? What we've been learning for years, years learning. It says we will have to learn in a few months. So what others have been learning for how long? For years. You and I in the last generation do not have the privilege of taking years to learn it. We have but a few months. Now, my brothers and sisters, when the prophet said that, I believe that you and I are living in those last few months right now today. And I believe we need to prove that from the Bible and the Spirit of Prophecy. What do you say? And so, my brothers and sisters, it tells us, page 71, I saw that many were neglecting this work of preparation. I saw that many, how many? Many. Do not realize what they must be in order to live in the sight of the Lord without a high priest in the sanctuary through the time of trouble. Those who receive the seal of the living God and are protected in the time of trouble must reflect the image of Jesus fully. Now, my brothers and sisters, it said that many don't know, don't know what they must be in order to live through the time of trouble without what? A high priest in the sanctuary. Now, when we sin today, what do we need in the sanctuary? We need an advocate, don't we? We need a mediator. We need a high priest. So if we sin, there's someone that can cover our sins, cleanse us from sin, forgive us of sin. But my friends, that is not enough for the last generation. You see, the last generation must be brought to the place where they can live in the sight of a holy God without a mediator. That means that they must have a different type of Christian experience. You see, the Christian experience that they need is to reflect the image of Jesus fully. Now, if we don't have a priest and we're going to be saved, what type of experience must we have? Seem like you don't want to say it. I'll say it then. We must have an experience where we're not sinning. Did you hear what I said? Now, people don't like to teach that, but I don't mind teaching what the Bible says. Amen? You see, you can't look like Jesus and be sinning. You can't do that. Did Jesus sin? How many times did Jesus sin? So if we are restored into the image of Christ, will we be sinning or not sinning? Because if we're sinning, friends, we don't look like Jesus. The Bible says all have sinned and have come short of the glory of sin does not bring glory to God. Do you think sin brings glory to God? I don't believe any one of us in here would think that. Sin comes short of bringing God glory. But through the threefold message, 
The Bible says that there's going to be produced a people that fear God and give glory to God. And we can't give glory to God unless we reflect the image of Jesus. My friends, the Bible says in 1 Peter chapter 2, what Jesus looked like. 1 Peter 2, beginning, and verses 21. Let's read that together. The Bible says, for even what? 1 Peter 2, 21. You'll believe the Bible. Watch what we read in the Bible. 1 Peter 2, 21. It says, for even here unto were you what? Call. Because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us what? So Christ has left us a what? What does an example mean? Something that you don't have to pay attention to? An example is something that we should follow. So Christ has left us an example. What was the example? Notice what he goes on to say. That ye should do what? Follow his steps. We are to walk in the footsteps of Jesus. I want to walk in those footsteps. What do you say? Well, notice the first thing it says in the next verse. Next verse. The Bible says, it says, verse 22, who did what? How much sin? So if we, this is the example that Christ left us, what was the example? Number one, he did what? No sin. If this is the example that Christ left and we are to follow in his example, in his footsteps, then as Christians, we must be brought to the place where you and I do know. Now, can we do that without Jesus? No, we can't do that without Jesus. The Bible says, without me, you can do Question, is there enough power in the gospel to bring us to the place where we can have victory over sin? Now, when a man says there's not, that man does not know anything about Jesus. He doesn't know anything about the power of Jesus. You know, we sing about it, but sometimes we don't really believe it. We say, would you be free from the burden of sin? There is power in the blood, power in the blood. Would you over evil a victory win? There is wonderful power in the blood. We sing it, but why is it that sometimes when we come to the gospel message, we say, oh, man can't stop sinning. We're only human. Well, my friends, if all you have is access to human power, you're right, you won't stop sinning. But if we, humanity blends with divinity, my friends, Jesus says, what is impossible to man is possible through Jesus Christ. The Bible says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthened me, Philippians 4.13. And so the great work to be accomplished is that we must look just like Jesus. He must bring, bring us to the place where we do no sin, we have victory over sin, because when there is no priest in the sanctuary, the only ones that can live successfully through that time are those who do not need a priest because they've gotten victory through Jesus Christ over sin in their lives. Are you with me this morning? Now, I want to ask you a question. Is that your experience this morning? Do you have victory over every sin in your life this morning? If you and I be honest with ourselves, we will recognize that we don't look just like Jesus. And so, there is a great work to be done for us. Is that right? Is it a great work to make you look just like Jesus? To reflect his image fully. But this says there's a great work and little time. And if I show you today, that we have but a few short months to a few short years for the gospel to bring us back to a place where we look just like Jesus, having victory over every sin in our lives. That is the only experience that will get us ready for what's coming. And there's only one thing we need in order to do that. We need Jesus living in our hearts. Are you with me? In fact, the Bible says in 1 John, let's go there. 1 John chapter 3, and when you get there, let me know by saying amen. 1 John chapter 3, notice what the Bible says. And 1 John, the third chapter, and when you get there, let me know by saying amen. 1 John 3, beginning, and verse 6. Notice what the Bible says. 1 John 3, verse 6, the Bible says, Whosoever abideth in him. Who's the him? This is Jesus. Whosoever abideth in him does what? So if we want to stop sinning, we have to learn how to abide where? In Jesus. The Bible says, whosoever abideth in him sinneth not. Whosoever sinneth have not what? Have not seen him. Who's the him? Jesus. In other words, this is what John meant when he said, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away, how much? 
the sin of the world. And if we're looking at Jesus, how much of our sin is he going to take away? Oh, my friends, this is why we must turn our eyes upon Jesus and away from the television. I can promise you, desperate housewives are not going to take away our sin. They're going to add to it, I promise you. You see, Jesus is not in desperate housewives. These movies that we watch, they're not bringing us closer to Jesus, and it's Satan's plan to get us so caught up in these things that we have no time to develop the sweet, lovely image of Jesus Christ. And so, my friends, the Bible says, Whosoever sinneth have not seen him, neither known him. Verse 8 says, He that committeth sin is of the devil, for the devil sinneth from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested. That he should do what? That he might destroy the works of the devil. Verse 9, let's all read that together. The Bible says, Whosoever is what? Is born of God, doth not commit sin. Then if we're sinning, it shows that we don't have an experience with Jesus that we need. Are you with me? The Bible goes on to say, For his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin. Why? Because he is born of God. What we need is the seed to remain in us. Who's the seed? The Bible says, I speak not into seeds as of many, but into seeds as of one, and that one is Jesus Christ in Galatians 3. And so, my friends, what we need is the seed in us. This is why our only hope in the last generation is Christ not knocking at our hearts. Oh, that's a wonderful opportunity while we have time. But that will not save a man, Christ knocking at the door of the heart. The answer is that Christ must do what? Come in and sup with him. This is the message to the last church. The only hope is Christ in us, the hope of glory. And so, my friends, before we go a little bit further, I see my time is getting away from me. You need to pray for this clock, amen? I'm looking at this time and say, we need to study this Bible, amen? So let's pray together before we go a little bit further. Notice what the Bible, let's pray together and then we'll get right into the Bible. Oh, Father, there's so much to cover. And so, Father, we pray that in the short amount of time that we have left in this session, that you will open up our hearts to the study of the truth. For, Lord, there's a great work to accomplish. There's but a little time in which to do it. And Lord, when I look in our homes and our hearts, we are wasting the time in things that are not making us like Jesus. Oh, Father, make us concerned. Give us a conviction of heart that we might want to learn how Jesus can take total possession of our minds and hearts because when the seed remaineth in us, we will have total victory over every sin. We will reflect the image of Jesus fully. Thus being ready for the seal of God instead of the mark of the beast. And, oh, Father, we have but just a little time to do it. Show us the great urgency of the few months that we're living in, that we might make haste to redeem the time, that we might be ready to meet Jesus. Now, to abide with us in these few moments and remove every distraction. And we ask this in the worthy name of Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. If you'll take your Bibles, we want to go to the book of Matthew. What book did I say? To the book of Matthew, chapter 24. In the book of Matthew, chapter 24, we want to notice what the Bible says. Now, brothers and sisters, we're going to get to a point where we're just going to have to stop and pick up here when we go into the next session. Amen? Notice what the Bible says, Matthew 24. Matthew 24, notice what the Bible says. Now, we studied last night, we found that the last act in the drama is what? What is the last act in the drama? The mark of the beast. What is the mark of the beast? It is Sunday worship. When Sunday worship is in force, that brings us to the last act in the drama. We read in volume 7 of the Testimonies, page 141, that the mere exaltation of Sunday in place of the Bible Sabbath is the last act in the drama that the laws of men are going to take the place of the laws of God, and that in free America, that has once stood for religious and civil liberty, we're going to see church and state unite to enforce a national Sunday law. We proved 
from the Bible that that's going to be the last act of the drama. We prove that this is the little time in which we have to get ready. We prove that Satan would bring a power that would think to change times and laws and that all of this is moving to the final events over the seal of God and the mark of the beast. We prove from the Bible, as we notice the text, that in Revelation 13 there are two powers that Satan are going to bring together. First brought to view under the beast, then under the two-horned beast that are going to unite together to make this take place. Now some people, as I say this, as we do seminars like this, they say to me, young man, what makes you so sure that we have just a little time left? Well, my friends, I'm not sure about that. I'm more than sure. Did you hear what I said? In fact, the message this morning that we're going to delve in and begin to and continue is called more than sure. You see, man can be sure, but when we have the prophecies, we're not just sure. We can be more than sure about what's going to take place. God has given us the script to end time events. He has given us a revelation of what is going to take place. How do I know? In the book of Amos, chapter 3, verse 7, the Bible says, Surely the Lord God will do... You believe the Bible? Do you believe the Bible? Surely the Lord God will do nothing. How much is nothing? But reveal his secrets unto his servants, the prophets. And so in time events, the truths of God, God will do nothing but reveal his secrets unto his servants, the prophets, which means that if we want to know the secrets, we need to study the prophets. Are you with me? Both the prophets of the Bible and God's modern prophets at the end of time. And if Satan wanted to make us not know what's going to take place, all he would do is keep us from the prophets. He would take us from the Bible. He would take us from the spirit of prophecy. He would make us believe that Sister White was not a true prophet. My friends, this is a deception of the devil. Because he knows that if we study the Bible and the testimonies, we will not be surprised by what Satan is doing. These Bible and the spirit of prophecy, these books would make Satan look like an amateur magician. You know what an amateur magician is? He does a trick, but you see what he's doing, don't you? The Satan is trying to do tricks, and all of a sudden man can say he's levitating, and all of a sudden you see the little trick underneath the sleeve of what he's doing. When you have the Bible and the spirit of prophecy, it reveals every one of Satan's tricks, and so he hates it. He's wroth with the church that has the commandments of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. And the testimony of Jesus, you know what it is? Revelation 19.10 says, the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. And so, my friends, this is why it's so significant. We don't have to guess. The Bible says, and that knowing the time, not guessing, and that knowing the time, that now it is high time to awake out of sleep, for now is our salvation nearer than when we believe. Romans 13, 11. Jesus said, I tell you before it come to pass, so that when it is come to pass, you might believe. John 14, 29. God has given us this so that we can be more than sure. In fact, the Bible says in Matthew 24, and when you get there, let me know by saying amen. Beginning in verse 3, the Bible says in verse 3, and as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came into him how? Privately saying, tell us when shall these things be? And what shall be the sign of thy coming? And what else? And of the end of the world. And Jesus gave them clear signs. We talked about some of these signs, but we saw that he gave them something specific in verse 32. He talked about wars and rumors of wars, environmental calamities, but in verse 32, notice what it says. It says... Now learn a parable of what? Of the fig tree. When his branch is tender and put forth leaves, you guess that the summer is nigh. Is that what the Bible says? What does the Bible say? You know that the summer is nigh. Question. When spring comes around and the leaves that have fallen off the tree through winter begin to come back on the tree, do you go to your neighbor and say, what mean these leaves? Does anybody do that? I didn't do that. Why doesn't he do that? When he looks at the leaves on the tree, he recognizes that what has come. 
that spring shows that summer is not far away. Are you with me? And so as we look at this, we don't have to guess. We don't have to go to our neighbors and say, do you believe this? If we understand the signs, we can know without a short of a doubt what's coming. In fact, in verses 33, it says, So likewise ye, when ye shall see what? All these things, don't guess about it, but know that it is near, how near? Even at the doors. Oh, I wish we had time. I wish we had a whole week just to study this. I wish we had time just to stop right there because sometimes we read that and we don't understand what that means. What does it mean for Jesus to be even at the doors? Because my friends, in 2008, if you understand this, we got to the door. Something happened prophetically that moved us where we're even at the door. And Jesus says that when we get to that place, verily I say unto you, verse 34, verily I say unto you that this generation shall what? Shall not pass until all these things be fulfilled. And my friends, I promise you upon the authority of the word of God, we are that generation. We will not pass until these things are fulfilled. My friend, somebody says, how can you be so sure? I'll never forget, I was in one place, and I see it many times, sincere brethren come to me, older brethren, and they say, young man, I used to preach just like you. And I used to preach that Jesus was coming, and that he was coming soon, but, 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 but I'm a grandfather now. What makes you so sure that that cannot be so? Have you ever heard that before? I've heard that many times. And I say to them very humbly and respectfully, no, you did not preach like me. You see, there is a difference between a UFO and an IFO. What is a UFO? Unidentified flying object. What is an IFO? And then I begin to explain to them that there were many things that men in the 20s and the 30s and the 40s and the 50s and the 60s on down to the present time, there are events that they saw, but they did not identify them on the prophetic chart. Are you with me? And because of that, they were wrong in their interpretation. They saw something. They saw prophetic events, but they were unidentified in the stream of time. And as a result, they miscalculated the prophecies. But my brothers and my sisters, God has told us in this book called Great Controversy. You heard of this book? You believe this book? I'm going to prove to you today that this book has never been more relevant than it is today. Great Controversy, page 598. It says something. Great Controversy, page 598. I want you to write this down. Great Controversy, page 598. It says, however strong we may be, however confident we may be that the minister knows what is truth, this is not our foundation. In other words, we cannot base our faith on what a man says. We cannot base our faith on what a church says. We must base our faith on what Jesus says. The Bible says we must study for ourselves, and this is why I told you, every meeting, bring your Bibles. Bring pen and papers so that you can see for yourself and know for yourself because you are going to have to leave from this place and begin teaching your family and friends. Everywhere I go, do you know that as a result of these meetings, my own family has been revived and reformed as they study these truths. My own father called me and told me he's been studying the books we've written and the messages we've given, and he says, I believe it with all my heart, Jesus is coming. My friends, it's time to reach those who are nearest and dearest. Now, everybody's not going to listen. That's all right. Everybody didn't get on board that ark, but we must do everything we can to warn as many as can so that we can get ready. What do you say? This is why I'm here this morning. You may never hear a series of messages like this again in your life, but we're going to study from the Bible so that you can understand what the Bible says. We have a great work and little time in which to do it, and our faith must be based not on what a man says, but on the Word of God. It says, Great Controversy, 598, it says, We have a chart, a what? A chart pointing out every way mark. How many? Pointing out every way mark on the heavenward journey, and it says, We ought not to guess at anything. Now, my brothers and sisters, when we talk about prophetic events, we should not be guessing. Jesus said, 
we may know that his coming is near. Paul said, and that knowing the time. Amos said, and surely, certainly, we can know these things. We don't have to guess at anything. And so there's a prophetic chart. And I'm going to show you today, I'm going to show you today that the Sunday law could not have been passed based on the events until after 1990. Did you hear what I said? What did I say? The Sunday law could not have been enforced until after 1990. Now, my brothers and sisters, that, it's going to take some study in the Bible to believe that. Is that right? We're going to have to study this Bible to understand it. We're going to have to see what in the Bible shows us in the order of events that the Sunday law could not have been passed until the year 1990. We're going to prove that. Now, my brothers and my sisters, Jesus said that he's given us some things that we can know, and then he says, this generation will not pass until all these things be fulfilled. And somebody says, well, I thought no man can know the day nor the hour. And that's true. No man can know the day nor the hour until a certain time. Will there ever be a time when men know the day and hour of the coming of Christ? If you believe that, raise your hand. Let me see your hands if you believe that. Now, if you believe that no man will ever know the day and the hour until Jesus comes, let me see your hands if you believe that. I see your hands. Now, that wasn't everybody in the church, so I asked a third question. If you don't know, just raise your hand. That's all right. It's time to read and study right now today. Amen? Now, my friends, I would go through the time, but we don't have time to go through all the texts that explains from the Bible that there will be a time when God makes known the day and the hour at the seventh plague. God is going to make known the day and the hour of his coming before Jesus comes. In fact, in this little book called Great Controversy, page 640, it says, just before Jesus comes, sometime before he comes, when God's people are delivered, Great Controversy 640 through 642, it says, the voice of God is heard from heaven, declaring the day and hour of Jesus' coming, and delivering the everlasting covenant to his people, like peals of loudest thunder, his worlds roll through the earth, and the wicked, they hear, and all they hear is the sound of thunder, but the righteous hear the day and hour of the coming of Christ, they understand it to be the voice of God. Are you with me? Now, my brothers and sisters, that tells us that man's understanding of Matthew 24 is faulty. Because many people think, oh, we'll never know the day and the hour until Jesus comes. But that meant, eh, we don't have time to study that, so I won't introduce that. But we don't have time to study that. But the point is, no man will know the day and the hour until after the close of probation. But before the close of probation, the Bible says, we may know that his coming is near, according to Matthew 24, verse 32 and 33. Now, my question would be, how near? Does that make sense? Is that a good question? We know that we have a limit before the close of probation. Before the close of probation, we cannot know the day nor the hour, but we can know that it is near. And the question is, how near Jesus? I think it's a good question if he says we must know it's near. Now, my brothers and my sisters... I don't want to hear the answer of a man. Man is often wrong. Is that true? But God is never wrong. The wonderful number of he that knows the end from the beginning, he knows and he has told us that we may know as near. How near? He said in the next verse of Matthew 24 and verse 34, after saying his coming is near, he tells us how near by linking the question with the word verily. You know verily means I'm going to explain something deeper. So he says, verily, you remember that, that, that Nicodemus came to Jesus and said, how can a man be born again? Jesus told him to be born again. And Jesus said, verily, was he talking about something different or was he giving a deeper explanation of what he already said? Verily. So Jesus said, you may never know, know that his coming is near. How near? Verse 34, verily I say unto you that this generation shall not pass until how much? All these things be fulfilled. Now, that means that this is a generation that's going to be alive to see Jesus. That is not the first generation. We call that the last generation. That is not the beginning generation. We call that the final generation. While we cannot know the day and the hour before the close of probation, we can know the final generation that will be alive to see the Sunday law and to meet Jesus. And my friends, we are in that generation today. We're in it today. 
And there are signs that we must be able to see. Jesus says, when you see all these things. So we need to know, what was Jesus talking about? What did he see? What were these events that if we see them, we can know when his coming is near, and that when we see them, we can know that this generation would not pass until all these things be fulfilled. What has God given us to have the ability to know that time? Go to the book of 1 Thessalonians. What did I say? 1 Thessalonians. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, notice what the Bible says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. And when you get there, let me know by saying amen. Because brothers and sisters, we need to answer this question. On the front cover of the Time magazine just a few months ago, you know what was asked on that front cover? You know whose face that is? You know whose face this is? This is the Pope, the present Pope, Benedict XVI, a few months ago. And the question was asked, what? Why the Pope, what? Loves America. Do you think the Pope loves America? Oh, yes, he loves America. Yes, he does. Yes, he does. He loves America. And we're going to prove that today. Now, the question is, why does the Pope love America? That's the question. And my brothers and sisters, Time Magazine can't give you the answer. But the Bible can. We're going to see why. We can't get to it just now. But we're going to see why. Because this means something prophetic for us today. Why the Pope loves America. Now, in 1 Thessalonians, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, I want you to notice something. 1 Thessalonians 5, beginning in verses 1. And when you get there, let me know by saying amen. Beginning in verse 1, the Bible says, But of the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I do what? That I write unto you. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord does what? So come of how? As a thief in the night. How many of you have ever heard that preached before? You know what I've heard from that? I've heard people say, then how can we think that we can know the last generation or the coming of Christ? Because the coming of Christ will come how? As a, as a thief in the night. And I used to believe that until I began to study the Bible for myself. And as I began to study the Bible for myself, I found out that while it is true that the coming of Christ will be as a thief for some, it is not true for everybody. Are you with me? I want to show you that from the Bible. Verse 3, the Bible says, in verse 3, the Bible says, For when they shall say what? Now, it would be interesting. The Bible says when they, wouldn't it be interesting to know who the they are? Because they are already saying it right now. It says, When they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall what? Shall not escape. Verse 4 says, let's read it together. But ye brethren are not where? Are not in darkness that that day. What day is that? What day is it talking about? The coming of Jesus. All these things that connect with end time events. It says that day, we are not in darkness, that that day should overtake you as a what? So my brothers and sisters, while some people will be surprised, the Bible introduces another class that will not be surprised. And what does it call them? What does it call them? It says, and ye brethren, I want to be a part of these brethren, what do you say? And ye brethren are not in darkness. Well, who were these brethren? Verse 5. The Bible says in verse 5, it says, ye are all the children of what? Of light and the children of day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. The reason why we will not be surprised, because the Bible says we are children of what? We're children of life. Now, my brothers and sisters, we're going to have to stop right here. I want to go on. I don't have enough time. My, my session has come to an end. But I want you to understand this. If we are not going to be surprised, we must become children of of life. And if we're children of light, we will not be surprised at what's coming. 
And so, my friends, we're going to prove that when we become children of light, we would have understood that the Sunday law could not have been passed until after 1990. We're going to come back in the next session. We're going to pick up right here, and we're going to see why. Why was this the case? What is happening? What is going on today in America that proves that we have but a great work and but a little time in which to do it, and I want to be ready to do it? What do you say? Or you, do you want to be ready to meet Jesus? My friends, we have but a few short months to a few short years, and everything we should do should be done right now. We should be saying, Lord, whatever it takes, if you've never consecrated yourself to God, you need to do it today. You need to take your families. You need to take your property and your possession and give everything to Jesus and say, Lord, it's yours. What do you want me to do? Now, if this is your desire, would you reverently kneel with me as we close in prayer? Oh, Father in heaven, we've just laid a foundation. There's much to cover. We, Lord, are living in 2009, and we have but a few short months to a few short years. And, Father, you've told us not to guess about these things. You have told us that we can know these things. You said that if we study the prophets, that you will reveal to us what is going to be in this closing work, that you will do nothing but reveal your secrets to your servants, the prophets, and that if we're children of light, we don't have to be surprised. And, oh, Father, I pray that you would open up our minds to the light of heaven, that as we study to see the little time that we have left, that it may put an urgency in our hearts that we might focus on the great work that needs to be accomplished. Because, Lord, unless we look just like Jesus, we'll never be ready. Unless we know Jesus for ourselves, We'll never be ready for the last act in the drama. And when Sunday comes, with the passing of a national Sunday law, many Seventh-day Adventists, old and young, will wake up and want to get things right, but it's going to be too late. And when I look at the teenagers, and as I look at the children, Lord, that are just playing games with God, I pray, Lord, that you would waken them because they have a great work to do. That as their army of youth rightly trained, that both youth and adults and whole families will give themselves over to the work that was done by John the Baptist, that we might make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Lord, we want to be ready to meet you. And so we ask that you would come into our hearts this morning. In Jesus' name, amen.